Welcome to the Uproarious World of the Producers, a 1967 film that's not your typical Hollywood fare. Filled with unexpected laughs, shocking twists, and a dash of sadness, this classic promises an entertaining ride from start to finish. As you relish the comedic brilliance, consider this which classic Hollywood actor stole the show for you amidst the various roles who stood out as your favorite. Buckle up because there are plenty of funny, shocking, and even somber facts waiting to unfold. So who's your pick and what moments had you in stitches, gasping or maybe shedding a tear? Share your most cherished memory or personal experience related to this film in the comments below. We're eager to hear your stories and anecdotes. Keep watching for more and let the laughter roll. The 1967 film directed by Mel Brooks made a lasting impact on the world of cinema with its unique blend of satire and humor. Initially met with mixed reviews, the movie's brilliance soon became evident as audiences recognized the daring approach to comedy and the willingness to push boundaries. The film's irreverent take on Broadway and show business resonated with viewers and the characters Max Bialystok, portrayed by Zero Moss Tell, and his accomplice Leo Bloom, played by Gene Wilder, became iconic figures. The success of the movie transcended the silver screen, leading to a Broadway musical adaptation in 2001, which went on to win a record-breaking 12 Tony Awards. This cultural phenomenon spawned various spin-offs, including a 2005 film adaptation of the Broadway musical, with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick reprising their roles. The producer's influence extended beyond cinema and theater, with merchandise like DVDs, soundtracks, and memorabilia becoming sought after among fans. The legacy of this groundbreaking work of art endures as its impact on comedy and satire continues to be acknowledged in various forms of entertainment. The fearless exploration of taboo subjects and the ability to elicit laughter from unlikely sources cemented its place in the annals of comedic history. In conclusion, the journey from the 1967 film to the Broadway stage and beyond exemplifies the lasting impact of a daring and innovative approach to storytelling. The laughter it generated and the cultural footprint it left showcase the enduring legacy of a truly groundbreaking work of art. Estelle Winwood expressed strong distaste for the producers, stating that she couldn't bear to watch it, even on a small television. She attributed her participation to financial necessity, suggesting that living in Hollywood weakens one's motives. According to her, the film reminded her of the saying that underestimating the American public's taste is a profitable strategy. The last scene of the movie, featuring Max and Leo outside the fountain at Lincoln Center, held personal significance for Gene Wilder. He believed that Leo's ecstasy in the scene mirrored his own feelings at that time, ultimately convincing him to continue pursuing acting. In a 1966 interview with Playboy magazine, Mel Brooks discussed his upcoming project, Springtime for Hitler. He revealed that it would be a play within a play or a play within a film, emphasizing it as a comedic portrayal involving Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun at Berchtesgaden. Brooks added humorous details about Hitler, such as his talent as a dancer and his affection for a parakeet named Bob, intending to bring out these aspects in the play. These insights offer a glimpse into the making of the producers and the personal experiences of those involved in its production, providing context to the film's unique elements. Mel Brooks' unconventional approach to humor is evident, and the anecdote about Gene Wilder's decision to continue acting adds a personal touch to the behind-the-scenes dynamics. The film, despite its reception, remains an interesting chapter in cinematic history. Kenneth Mars, who portrayed Franz Liebkind in the 1967 film, went to great lengths to immerse himself in his character. To enhance his performance, Mars slept in his costume every night, showcasing a commitment to authenticity. Additionally, Mars suggested incorporating pigeon poop on Liebkind's helmet, adding a touch of realism to the character. Mel Brooks, the creative force behind the movie, experienced an unexpected win at the Oscars for Best Screenplay. Surprised by the honor, Brooks collected the award without a prepared speech, highlighting the genuine and unscripted nature of the moment. Lee Meredith, responsible for bringing the character Ulla to life, dedicated herself to mastering a convincing Swedish accent. Despite her efforts, when the film premiered in Scandinavia, Meredith faced a humorous twist Norwegians mistook her for Danish, while Danes believed she was Swedish, showcasing the intricacies of language perception. 
These behind-the-scenes anecdotes shed light on the dedication of the cast and the unexpected moments that unfolded during the production of this acclaimed film. Such details offer a glimpse into the unique challenges and surprises that shaped the making of this iconic piece of cinema, providing a richer understanding of the individuals involved. Mel Brooks' 1967 film, adapted into a Broadway musical in 21, saw a tremendous success with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick in the lead roles. The musical, staged at the St. James Theatre, not only ran for an impressive two 502 performances, but also clinched 12 Tony Awards, setting a record. Remarkably, this success prompted a 2005 film adaptation reuniting Lane and Broderick as the main characters. Brooks, granted an unusual level of creative control for a novice director, secured this autonomy through a unique contract. Sidney Glazier, the producer, based this decision on Brooks' comedic background with Sid Caesar and his notable work on the 2,000-year-old man audio recording with Carl Reiner. Brooks, further sealing the deal, agreed to direct at a significantly reduced fee, allowing Glazier to gather $600,000 for the movie's production. Gene Wilder shared an amusing anecdote from a dinner celebrating the film's release. Zero Moss tells playful switch of Wilder's place card with Dick Shawns led to Wilder sitting at the main table, adding a touch of humor to the off-screen dynamics. In conclusion, the producers, a classic in both film and stage, witnessed remarkable success in its various adaptations, with Mel Brooks' unique contract and the entertaining off-screen incidents adding intriguing layers to its production history. In the making of the film, Gene Wilder envisioned his reactions, mirroring the audience's experience with the on-screen madness. When portraying Leo's hysterics in Max's office, Wilder drew inspiration by imagining Zero Moss Tell, his co-star, tormenting his own pet dog to capture the right emotional intensity. Mel Brooks revealed that producer Joseph E. Levine initially deemed Gene Wilder unfit for the role after viewing some footage, offering Brooks extra funds to replace him. However, Brooks successfully persuaded Levine that Wilder was suitable for the part and could make the movie succeed. These behind-the-scenes insights into Gene Wilder's creative process and Mel Brooks' negotiations with the producer shed light on the challenges faced during the production, contributing to the film's eventual success. Zero Moss Tell, taking Gene Wilder under his wing, formed a unique friendship contrary to Moss Tell's reputed demeanor. Wilder recalled, he always took care of me as if I were a baby sparrow. Their camaraderie defied Moss Tell's bombastic reputation, creating a nurturing dynamic between them. In the original screenplay, Franz Liebkind's character included an oath swearing allegiance to various figures, a scene accompanied by the Ride of the Valkyries. The Siegfried Oath pledged loyalty to Siegfried, Richard Wagner, Friedrich Nietzsche, Paul von Hindenburg, the Graf Spee, the Blue Max, and Adolf You-Know-Who. This detail elucidates Franz's vehement cry upon entering Max's office, you have broken the Siegfried Oath, you must die. The musical adaptation later reinstated this significant oath. During the film's climax, Gene Wilder crafted half of Leo's courtroom monologue, while Mel Brooks penned the other half. This collaborative effort between Wilder and Brooks contributed to the impactful conclusion of the film, showcasing their joint creative prowess. In the collaborative process of the producers, Gene Wilder and Zero Moss tells unique friendship, the restoration of the Siegfried Oath in the musical version, and the shared creation of Leo's monologue underscore the film's depth and creative synergy. These insights enrich our understanding of the film's production, highlighting the unexpected elements that shaped its narrative, 